Today, so sixth session today, we will talk about model following control. So model following control is when you see it for the first time, it looks like it's a lot of matrices and it's quite difficult to understand, but we'll see today that it's really easy. The only thing is you have to understand what we're doing, what's the meaning of each matrix and polynomial. Indeed, as a small introduction, we will have only one exercises today. So we will look at an helicopter. So uh, not a three degree of freedom helicopter, but only one degree of freedom here that will be considered. So if you look on the small video, the goal today is to control the pitch of the, an helicopter that we have in the Institute. And the idea is that we have one sensor which is the angle of the, um, the pitch angle of the helicopter. And we have one actuator, which is the main propeller. Okay, the, the propeller at the, at the rear here is not used. We're only using this one. And as you can see, it's not aligned with the center of rotation here, our axis of rotation, so that we can create a torque and we can uh, move the helicopter uh, or change the pitch angle of the helicopter. And to do that, we will use model following controller. So the question is why using model following controller instead of just pole placement as we've seen, uh, was it last week? So the idea of model following controller is we have a, a system. So here we, just, we have a discrete system. Uh, here there's some disturbance that we will just skip that part for, for the beginning. So we have a system and the idea is to design three polynomials. Okay, so this F, P, and Q are only polynomials. We will write them in negative power of Z, it can also be written in positive power of Z, but still it's only polynomial. So there's a prefilter polynomial, a feed forward polynomial, and a feedback polynomial. So the goal of this polynomial here, if I just use a pen, so this polynomial Q here is just used to place the poles, okay? So if we remove, if we set this one to one and this one to one, we end up with a classical control loop here that is just pole placement. And so the, the idea of modeling controller is to add two other polynomials. So first to add this one, this one over P, the idea is to try to remove the P from the system, to try to remove this element here. Uh, just as first guess, if we set P of Z equals P of Z, then here I can simplify everything and I just have uh, one over A of Z times Z minus D, okay? If I also include Z minus D, it's even better. I only have one over A of Z, but we will see that this is not possible, okay? So this is not possible uh, to fully compensate the zeros of the plant, but still one over P is trying to compensate some zeros of the plant. And we will see which kind of zeros we can compensate. Finally, there's this F of Z. F of Z here is just, um, so it's a prefilter polynomial. It's just to make sure that in steady state, Y is equal to omega, okay, on in steady state. So that's just the, the, the overall picture. Uh, so the control goal is first to place the poles. So have some closed loop behavior using a PT2 as usual, that, mostly will be designed with the Q polynomial. Then we'll try to remove the stable zero dynamics. So we'll see what this stable zero dynamics means, but it's just a stable zeros in B of Z. And for static unit gain will be mostly done with F of Z and then add integration of the control error. So if here there's no integrator here, so remember integrator in discrete time is C minus one, it's a pole located at one. If there is no integrator, we will wish to add one, probably in P, for example, so that we make sure that if there's a steady state error, it will be compensated, it will be, the error will be integrated. Okay, now let's dive into this first exercise. So we have a plan. So this is a model I was just describing uh, before. We want to control the, the pitch angle. So pitch angle is the rotation of this helicopter. There's uh, fictitious axis here. It's not really good drawing, whatever. And we have the angle phi of uh, uh, psi of z here. So this is the angle we should control. And we got the input and the input in this case is um, voltage of the motor, if I remember well. 
but whatever the, the yeah the input voltage of the motor the motor it's not the rotor but whatever and we have the plan that is already given it had been identified with probably some black box modeling or whatever we have the plans and we wish to apply the model following control method so that our desired behavior or close loop behavior of the, um, the, the helicopter is following a PT2, okay? And the PT2 has this specification here, omega and zeta, and we already know how to compute the poles in continuous time, discretize the poles, but we will do it again today. The first question here is, uh, before diving into the model following control method, is to have an idea of what kind of uh, uh, zeros we can compensate. Because the idea here is to infer the closed loop, ask for a pole placement method, and on top of it, try to remove the zero time x. And the first question is, if I've got, so before removing the zero dynamics, let's just identify what the zero dynamic is. So here's just, I just took the, the, the plant and I just, look at where the poles and zeros are located in open loop, and also what is the step response in open loop. So as we can see, there's three poles for our system, and there are, the three poles are inside the unit circle. So the plant, the open loop plant is stable, and we can therefore have the step response for the open loop, okay? The plant can be unstable. It's not a problem for applying model flow and controller, but here it's stable, it's just, just a matter of fact. So we can see, the, um, the step response, the open loop step response. And you can see these really high oscillations here. There's really like a really low damping factor. So the natural frequency, we can also compute the natural frequency if we want. I mean, everything is given by the two poles. So not the three pole story, these two poles mostly. Okay, the last pole is much faster. So it's not really important. And we also have two zeros, and these zeros are what, what is called non-minimal phase behavior. So it's the zeros are outside the unit circle, which means that it's unstable zeros. So unstable zeros, that does not make the plant unstable in open loop, but still that means that we cannot remove this unstable zeros. You cannot remove an unstable zero. And we will see that in a second. The only thing to remember is when you have um, non-minimal phase, behavior, you can see it already on the open loop and also in the closed loop. So here it's not easy to visualize. So I will just uh, plot it in MATLAB. So in MATLAB, I just define the sampling time, the Z variable, then the plant. Uh, this is completely useless. And then I just draw exactly what's on the, the bar point. So I just draw the root locus and then the, the open loop step response. And the zero dynamic can be seen here. Just move that here. Right at the beginning. So I want to follow some. So here's the static gain is on 250. So I'm rising. The signal is rising at the beginning. But if you zoom in, you see this strange behavior here that the, the plant is going to the steady state. So it's increasing. And at the third sample, it's decreasing before re-increasing re again, okay? And this is typical non-minimal phase behavior, okay? And so this is, this is happening because the zeros are outside of the unit circle. If the zeros were all inside the unit circle, then the, the response here will probably increase, or not here, but because there's also a dead time. So, I will have this and then it will keep increasing. It will always increase. It cannot increase, decrease and re-increase it, okay? So non-minimal phase behavior is exactly the same or the, the, where the, the non-minimal phase behavior can be seen to have the same effect in discrete time and in uh, continuous time, unless there's some ringing happening or whatever, but here it's the same in continuous and discrete time. So now if we go back to the, the main idea of the model for in controller, as I was just saying, is to remove these zero dynamics, but we can only remove the stable zero dynamics. Why is that so? And here I just make a really easy case that you can see that we cannot remove unstable dynamics without having an unstable controller. 
So if we, con if we consider a plant like this, that it's utterly simple, it's just a denominator A of Z, such that uh, the roots of A of Z plus one are inside the unit circle. We'll see what it's important in a second. And we have a zero, okay? The zero is located at B because we have D minus B. And then we want to implement a controller and we say, okay, why not taking controller one over Z minus B? Because if we take the controller to be one over Z minus B, the closed loop will be given as J of B or the, the open loop first is J of B time J of C, which is equal to Z minus B divided by Z minus B times uh, one over A of Z. This is canceling out. And so I've got one over A of Z and you know that the closed loop is the open loop divided by one plus the open loop. So this is the closed loop. And so our closed loop is perfectly stable because one of the hypotheses here is that A of Z plus one has all its roots within the unit circle, okay? So if we look at this, we say, okay, with the controller, we can, uh, we can compensate any zero. And indeed, there is a problem here. And the problem that's happening here is if we decompose this, we have our controller, which is one over Z minus B, and then our plant. And in between, there's a signal U. It is, this is the control variable. So in our case, it's a motor voltage, okay? If B is unstable, then the controller, one over Z minus B, is unstable. So that means that even if Y uh, w, so the reference uh, W is, for example, I know W equals one, then I will have Y equals one. This is, at least in simulation, it's possible. That will mean that you will go to whether plus infinity or minus infinity, okay? Or sh show some end association. And so here is just a simple example. Uh, if we still take this one over C minus B, and if we said now that uh, omega is equal to y in steady state, so we're only looking when uh, w, sorry, is equal to y, what's happening is that we can draw a uh, the difference equation of the controller. So remember, controller jc is one over c minus b, which is equal in this case to w minus, um, sorry, it's equal to u over w, minus y, so this is in the s domain, so it should be written like u of, or in the z domain, minus w of z minus y of z, okay? And so we see that if we're in steady state, omega is equal to y, and so the only term that is, uh, that we can get out of it is this difference equation. So we will end up, if w is equal to y, to uk plus one will be equal to b times uk, okay? And by definition, if the zero, because B is our zero, if it's inside the unit circle, then you can start with any U you want that is finite, you will always decrease to zero. So you will go to zero. If on the opposite, B is outside the unit circle, so is greater than one, the norm is greater than one, then you can say that UK plus one will always be greater than UK. So UK plus one in norm, will always be greater than UK. You are in steady state, okay? So if you are in steady state, this will always be true, I mean, forever. And so you will just increase, decrease, or show some end associations. So that's why when you have, um, when you're using model foreign controller or any other controller, when you try to compensate the zero with the controller, you have to make sure this zero is stable. It is clear for everyone because this is really important. It's very important that in model for in controller, we will, con we will compensate the zero dynamic of the plant, but only if the zero dynamic is stable. And this is why in model for in controller methods, we are decomposing the term B, so the, the numerator of our plant that contains the zero of the plant into a stable part and an unstable part. Really important. So now let's move on. Let's, uh, I guess here now, we will do this um, uh, simplification of B or decomposition of B. So the first step is always, if you want to apply model following controller, I mean, the important part here is this one, always express A of Z and B of Z in the following form. 
So in A of Z, it's negative four of Z and the first term has to be one, okay, always. Then for the numerator part, you should always have zero here and then some negative four. So what that means, that means that if I got a plant, I know one over uh, two minus uh, D minus one, then if I want to apply um, the model following control method, I have to say that A of Z is always one plus something. So here it would be one plus minus one half of Z minus one. And B of Z instead of being one in this case will be one half. Okay, I have always to divide by, by uh, always have to have a monic polynomial for A of Z. And in this case, for example, I cannot apply the method because the first term is non-zero here. Okay, and so this first term of B of Z being zero means that there's no direct fit through. What direct fit through means, so here, no fit through, no direct fit through here. Direct fit through means that the control input U of K, or if, if I look at Y of K, okay, then Y of K is a function of U of K. This is direct fit through and also y of k minus one, y of k minus two, u k minus one, whatever. Direct fit through means that u of k is affecting y of k, okay? So there is no delay in the input. So here, everything is fine. If we rewrite the a and b um, polynomial, uh, we will find, uh, I mean, it's written here. This is my a polynomial here. This is my P polynomial. And so I can add zero plus something for P, doesn't change anything. And then we'll look at the decomposition of B so that we can isolate the stable and the unstable series. So to do that, we decompose the plant numerator. We've already seen with the root locus method that we have two unstable zeros. So we have Z minus one times something. We factorize, always add the Z minus one. Uh, we can always factor it by z minus one because in B, the first term is zero. So here we can always write it as z minus one times a polynomial of some coefficient uh, z minus um, some coefficient, sorry, of z zero plus something for z minus one and so on. This is always possible. So if we factorize by z minus one, we end up with this polynomial, which is exactly the same as P of C, but we just skip one uh, power of, of z, so we just multiply by z. So we multiply this one by d, basically. And then we can find the roots. We already know that the roots are this one from the root locus study, but we can compute it again here. And we said that these roots are outside of the unit circle. So these zeros of the uh, plant are outside of the unit circle, which means that it's unstable dynamics. So everything unstable is in B minus. Question is what's left in B plus? In this case, B plus is just one. Cannot be zero, otherwise the decomposition will be B equals zero. So it doesn't make sense. So B plus is nothing, no zeros, it's one. And so we can write that B of Z is one delay, uh, a unit, one, and some zero dynamics, okay? And this is just, Always the same when you want to apply model flowing controller. The first thing is write A and B into this specific form. If you cannot do that, you cannot apply model flowing controller. And then decompose B with a stable and stable dynamics. If we just have a look at the MATLAB once again, there will be nothing really interesting here. Uh, so I've got A of B given in the um, uh, directly in the right format. So I've already uh, find A as a monic polynomial, B the first name should be zero. Then I define the plan dead time. We'll see that in a second. And then I just define that P zero is the roots of the B polynomial. So it's these two roots here that we've already talked about. Uh, B minus is basically everything in this case and B plus is just one. So I have P minus is this polynomial written as, as well in negative four of Z and B plus is just one, okay? And then N dot something is just the order of the uh, B minus and the order of B plus. So here we can, we'll talk about it later anyway. Just gonna run this. 
So now we have our B minus and our B plus. So why must BC divided into Z minus one, B plus, B minus? So this question here, really important, is just because we can only compensate the, the stable part, so we can only compensate this part here. Then what should the order of the desired denominator polynomial be? So remember in um, uh, model following controller, what we want is that the closed loop of the system with the controller is equal to some PW divided by AW, okay? And here's the question is what the order of this polynomial here? So just um, because we need to take the, the question in the right order, uh, first, before taking the question to the right order, why we need to define a minimum order of A of W is because we need the system to be causal as usual. So you know that the causal system is a system where there is more poles than zeros, okay? The question is how we can define if a system is causal or not in the Z domain uh, when we have a general form of, uh, of a transfer function. So here, let's assume that JW is some, uh, is written in positive power of Z. We'll see the case where it's written in negative power of Z in a second. And so what it means to be causal, uh, as I just said, is that this term here is higher order than this term here. And here I would just show you quickly why this means that this is causal, where, where this causality a criterion comes from. So first we have to put the denominator on the left, the numerator on the right. So we just take y of z multiplied by this expression here and u of z multiplied by this expression. So we just reorganize everything. And if we reorganize everything, we have this equation here. And here you should be able to recognize that this is um, somehow a difference equation. And you know that uh, for example, the term y of z times, uh, if I take a1 of z minus one, this is equivalent to y of k, uh, so it's z minus one, so k minus one times assembling time, time a1, okay? And so if we make this transformation, sorry, if we make this transformation, we can express that on the left-hand side we have yk times a0 plus y k, k plus one times a1. Yeah, so here I've written with a negative power, but if the power is positive, then it's a plus here and it becomes a plus here, obviously. And then we can go up to yk plus n. So the predicted output in n time step times a n, just a coefficient. And we can do the same on the right-hand side with the uk sequence. And now we can reorganize everything to end up with only y k plus n times a n on the left and everything else on the right, okay? And now we can see what causality means. And causality means that y k plus n can only depends on previous version of the output signal, which here is the case, okay? Because we took a n, it's always the case. But the most important is that y k of y k plus n cannot be a function of, for example, u k plus n plus one, because u k plus n plus one will be in the future. So the future cannot change the current value of y. So y k plus n should only be a function of u k hat. So here it's a u k hat with k hat that is lower or equal than k plus n, okay? And if we go back in our equation, here we have a n, or not a n is not important. What we what's important is that we have k plus n, and this n is coming from the fact that we have z to the power n in the denominator. And if we look at the future input that we need here, is u k plus m, okay? And m is coming from here. And from this equation here, and it's written just here, m should always be lower or equal than n, so that the output at time step k plus n is only a function of the input at k plus n, k plus n minus one, minus two, and so on, and not k plus n plus one. So this is where the causality criterion or whatever comes from. And that means that z to the power n should be greater than d to the power m or equal. 
And then we have a second um, definition, which is strictly causal. So a system is strictly causal if yk plus n is only a function of u k plus n minus one, u of k plus n minus two, and so on. So only previous version of the input. And this is called a strictly causal system. So strictly causal system, y of k is only a function of u, k minus one minus two, so only previous version of u. And so that means that m should be lower than n. So we have n poles here, and we should have at least, so maximum number of poles, uh, zero, sorry, m zero should always be lower than n poles. So m should be lower than n, which is really correct. Okay. This should be really clear, and it's more or less the same here than in continuous time. Now, the question is, we're sometimes working with negative power of z. So if now we rewrite exactly the same, but with re negative power of z, be careful. I'm, I can write it right away. M should be lower than n. This is not true anymore, OK? It's minus n and minus n. And so here, what's important is not n and m. n m can be anything. What's important is what's happening at the beginning. So a0, b0, this is really important. And so once again, I do exactly the same. I put everything on the left, everything on the right. Then I express it into terms of y of k, k minus one, and so on. And uh, finally, I put everything with respect to y of k. Then I've got previous version of k here of the output. And then I've got my inputs. And now what you can see, if I take exactly the same causality condition, so y of k is only a function of previous version of y of k, and a few of k, but where the input is always happening before y of k. Okay, so to have a causal system, y of k can only be a function of u of k, u of k minus one, and so on. And so here, well, what we need to look at in the equation is, a0. If a0 is not equal to 0, then my first term is, is y of k. If a0 is equal to 0, then the first term I will have in y will be y of k minus 1. OK? So admitting that a0 is not 0, then my first term is yk. What is the first input? What is the closest input to the current output? So current output is y of k. And the current input is u of k only if p0 is not 0. OK? So to have a causal system, so that's written here in this equation, that means that if a0 is equal to 0, for example, then b0 has also to be equal to 0. Because if b0 is not 0, I will have, this will vanish. I will have yk minus 1 is a function of everything else, and it will be a function of uk. And uk is happening after y, yk minus 1. So when you have polynomial or a system with two polynomials written in negative power of z, you always look at the coefficient and the first non-zero coefficient, let's say, for example, is this one multiplying z minus one. Then that means that on the, denom on the numerator, the first coefficient has to be zero, OK? If the first non-zero coefficient in the denominator is uh, a5 or a3, then that means that b0 should be equal to b1, should be equal to b2, should be equal to zero. And we have exactly the same condition for strictly causal system. So strictly causal system, if a0 is non-zero, b0 has to be 0. If a0 is 0, and let's say a0 equals a1 equals a2 equals 0, then that means that b0 should be equal to b1, should be equal to b2, should be equal to b3, should be equal to 0. OK? So this will be really important for our design. So if we want to make sure that a system is causal, whether we look at the positive power of z, and if it's given in the negative power of z, we need to look at the first coefficient to see if it's causal or not. And this is really important. Now let's move in. So we've seen uh, that the, the these are denominator polynomial. Uh, we will see it later, but the idea is that the the, the closed loop transfer function is causal. Then why we have to, de to define a so-called A0 polynomial. So the goal of this observer polynomial is that the system is, uh, that we can compute a solution. 
So here there is an equation, but we will see that everything in detail. So we are not going to take that much time. The idea is that this is the desired closed loop. Uh, in the desired closed loop, we should make sure that this is a causal system, whether it's written with negative or positive products, yes, as I've just shown before. And for some computation, uh, computational reasons, we need the A0 of Z so that there is one unique solution. And we will also see, see that in a second. So for now on, don't worry. The only thing you need to remember is that the desired closed loop behavior is always B over A, okay? And then we multiply the top and the bottom the numerator and denominator but by this A0 of Z that has a given order that we will define. And then we add the um, uh, open loop or the system delay, because the system delay, you cannot compensate for it. Otherwise, you will always have a non-causal system. So you always, a non-causal controller. So you always keep this in mind. So here, just to remember, we will see that in a second, the important part is here. We keep the system delay. We define some reference transfer function we want to follow in closed loop. And we had some polynomial, absolute polynomial that is doing absolutely nothing. You can see that it's completely, uh, I mean, one is compensating the other. So there's no problem on this. The only thing is it's used so that there is one unique solution. So now let's start with the proper design of this uh, model following control. The first part, I'm going to be quite quick because we've already seen that. We have our natural frequency and damping coefficient or damping factor that we want to, to follow. So we want to place the poles so that the, there's two conjugate complex poles that meets these requirements. Uh, so you can refer to exercise one of session five, so last session. We have this form for a, a PT2 is always this form. And so we can compute this quantity and this quantity, and we find that our uh, continuous poles are pi minus square root of two times minus one plus or minus j. Then we can discretize these poles using exponential of the complex uh, continuous poles times the sampling time ts that is given here. And we find our two uh, discrete poles. Out of this, we can find the characteristic polynomial so this is just, we should all remember that, but it's minus P1, Z minus P2, okay? And we have AW star. Uh, I called it here uh, AW star because AW, remember what we want at the end is that the closed loop is some PW divided by AW, W here, times some observer polynomial times some Z minus D. And the thing is that this A to volume should be designed so that the system is causal. So we don't know what, how many poles we need. And so as we don't know how many poles we need, this is our PT2 behavior. And we will add some remaining poles if required. And of course, these poles should be much faster than these um, two poles here, so that the PT2 is more or less followed, okay? So this is just another mathematical trick is to add some extra poles to make the system causal. Exactly the same as what we've done in exercise five. So now if we look at the overall picture, uh, this is our model following control. We know that we have described B as some stable and unstable part, and we have our desired AW star, which is only the two dominant poles we want. We can add as many as we want uh, thereafter. And the idea is to find this JW of D, which is our closed loop uh, reference transfer function of this system here. So here it's given in the lecture note, but it's, I'm not going to show it again here, but it's quite easy to, to find this expression. It's exactly the same as in continuous time. You multiply this one with this one, then you compute the closed loop of this with QZ, and then you add FZ at the end, and you find these two uh, transfer function. You have the, this one here would be the reference transfer function, the disturbance transfer function. They have the same poles, of course, and the numerator is changed a little bit. And what we're interested in at the beginning is this reference transfer function. So here, this guy here is nothing else than this one, okay? And if we have this, we know that F is unknown. We know that P is unknown and Q is unknown. Everything else is known, okay? 
And so the idea is to design f, p, and q so that this is equal to this. And this is only what we have to do for model foreign controller. And to compute this, there is a methodology that I'm going to describe now. So the methodology is first looking at the order of each polynomial, really important. So we have A of Z. A of Z must be a monic polynomial, already said that before. Uh, we have the planned dead time. So here's the planned dead time is uh, zero, okay, because it's I can add if I want here z to the power minus zero. So there is no dead time to our plant. If you find, um, yeah, I'm probably not going to make it here, but if in the if the b polynomial here will have been written as z um, <laughs> plus zero times z minus one plus something, let's call it alpha z minus two, for example, then we could have written this as always the first is zero. Then the second one should be non-zero. So I'm going to write alpha z minus one. And I'm going to multiply it by a delay. OK? So the delay is always, you need to add a delay so that in the b polynomial, the coefficient multiplying z minus one is non-zero. This is just the only thing you need to do. And finally, uh, remember also that here, the maximum negative power should match. So if here on the on the top, for example, this is zero, I still have to put it as zero, okay? So that means that when I write B, it's just for when we will put the coefficient into matrices, you have to remember that the B polynomial has the same number of terms at the A polynomial. Even if some terms are zero, it still counts as a term. Now, if we look at the plant order, so plant order is third order. We can see it whether here because it's a third order polynomial in the denominator. And then we can look at the B. So B of Z, we've already made, made the decomposition. Uh, what is the order of B of Z? It's only second order. So we just put a big red box, be careful. If we take this representation here, you can quickly identify that this is third order for A, second order for B. Be careful if you take the representation in negative power of z. Some of you will, will say, okay, this is third order, this is third order, third order, and this is wrong. Okay. If you have negative power of z, you always take the smallest negative power, the highest negative power, and you take the difference. So here it's three, and here it's c minus one, z minus three. So here it's only two. Okay. This is also really important to keep in mind. So we have our order for the A polynomial, B polynomial. And we also have done our pole placement. So we know that N A W star is equal to two. And here already there is a problem. There is a problem because N A omega star is equal to N B. And in the method, we always need strictly causal uh, system. So that means that N A omega star or N A omega should always be bigger than N B. So here, what I want is that n a omega is bigger than n of b. So here, there's um, two zeros. Here, there's two poles. So I need these remaining poles. I need one remaining pole, OK, at least one. We can add more than one, but it's just complexifying the controller for no reason. So we just add the minimum number of poles that are required so that our system is strictly causal. So strictly causal here, we can see it, um, from another way is that if we have, we want our uh, closed loop to be equal to this times a zero over a zero, so it's compensating. And this is what we identified in the previous slide. And so you can see that the order of the denominator here is aw, which is aw star plus, so two plus some remaining poles. And on the numerator here, uh, the, the order of the numerator will be defined by the order of b of z times the order of a of z f of z. And b of z, as you can see, is already order 2, and f of z is unknown. So if we say f of z is order 0, which is the minimum we can do, this will be order 2. This is order, for now, and it's 2 plus something. And so 2 plus something here should always be greater than this 2 here. So that means that remaining 0 the remaining pole that we need to add is at least one. So this is where it's coming from. It's coming from the fact that AW here, which has the same order as everything here, because we would design it that way, 
should be higher order than this, strictly causal, okay? Really important. So let's add this uh, extra pole that we need. Uh, we know that the poles are located around minus 2.22, one plus minus one J. So we'll take a pole that is way faster. So I just took minus 20 in continuous time. Minus 20 in continuous time, we can just discretize it with a sampling time of 0 0.05 second, if I remember well, whatever. And we can rewrite our characteristic polynomial AW. AW is AW star, so the PT2 behavior times the remaining pole, and we find a w um, uh, polynomial, and then we can write also that n a w is three. So the desired denominator of the closed loop will be order three, and the desired um, numerator order of the closed loop is order two. So it's strictly causal. On top of this, we can uh, of course check the condition, and then we can check that. We want a unit static gain. Um, so that means that during a steady state operation, we want that W is equal to Y or Y is equal to W. And so to add this, remember that uh, Y of Z will be equal to PW AW times C minus D um, W of Z. If we're in steady state, the delay is not important. And here I can just take everything or I can keep the delay anyway. In steady state, this will be evaluated at C equals one. Okay, you all know this. And so the static gain between Y and W is just everything here evaluated at one, at Z equals one. D equals one, one, this is one. And so what I end up with is P, W and A, W taken at Z equals one should be equals to one. If I want a steady gain of 10, here I will have written 10. Here I want one, so I put one. And so remember also from last exercise, uh, if z equals one, it's equivalent to saying I'm taking the sum of all the coefficient of pw and I divide by the sum of all the coefficient of aw. Aw is known, so I can compute the sum of all the coefficient of aw, which is aw at z equals one. It's the sum of all the coefficient that of aw, it's equal to approximately 0 0.014. And I have to make sure that pw uh, as at z equals one. So all the coefficient of pw should also be equal to 0 0.04, okay? So for now, we're not lo gonna look at this. We're gonna look at this when we will design the f polynomial. Remember, we got f polynomial. Here you got omega, the value. Okay, you got the feedback, you got the Q polynomial, you got one over P polynomial. You are our system, J of P, if I remember well, and something like that with one, okay? So this uh, condition here, we will look at it when we will investigate what F should look like. Now let's move on. We have our desired denominator. The desired numerator is for now, not, uh, not known, but we'll see in a second how we will define it. And we want a unit static gain. This is the only thing we want. So now we can restart from the expected polynomial here. Uh, this is ex what I expect at the closed loop. We can, or we've already shown that this can be written as this. So this is the reference transfer function of the system. And now we're just gonna make some, modification to it because we know that in B, we can describe B as Z minus one, B plus B minus. So the first step here is we're gonna, we're gonna define uh, all the Bs, we're replacing it by Z minus one, B plus B minus, okay? So you got it here, you have it here. And then there is a small trick is that we're multiplying by B plus minus one, B plus. B plus minus one B plus is just B plus over B plus, and it's equal to one. And I can do this because I know that in B plus, it's only stable zeros. So when I divide by B plus, I divide by something that is stable, okay? So I can do it. And if you do this, then you can remove all the B plus. Here I can remove one B plus, remove the B plus, remove the B plus, and you end up with the same expression here, but now, you are here, so you have B is now Z minus one B minus because we remove the B plus. 
And on this term here that was not multiplied by B, you end up with P tilde and P tilde is just P over P plus. So here it's not written as P over P plus, uh, but it's just nothing else than P over P plus, okay? Or P tied B plus is equal to P. I just took that from the lecture notes. Okay, now we have this should be equal to this. To make sure that this is equal, there's only one thing we can do. First, we can identify that Z minus D is just kind of useless because it's happening on both sides. And the only thing we're going to do, and it's already colored, is that PW is equal to the numerator and AW is equal to the denominator, as simply at this. And so we end up with these two expression. Here, there's a little bit, once again, of modification. Uh, the first modification is that uh, on top, we're going to divide by P minus. So just for some reason, it's, it, we're not dividing by P minus. We're just saying that PW is or can be written as PW tied times P minus. And on the denominator, there is no modification. Uh, if I remember what, no, there's no modification in the denominator. And also, last but not least, we multiply by A0, the numerator and the denominator, as we've seen before, so that we will have only one unique solution. Uh, okay. Now, here, if I quickly look at the first expression, it's pretty easy to, to solve because the only unknown is F. Um, here it's not A0, it's A observer, it's O, whatever. So A observer is, we will design it. So let's assume it's known. BW tiled, it's nothing else than BW. And I'm not gonna divide by B minus because we cannot divide by B minus, but there is the idea of dividing by B minus. So this is known, this is known, so BW tile is known, and Z, Z is just this, so it's known. So here, this, we can solve this. This is easy to solve. The only problem here is what is A0? This is a question. And to solve or to find A0, we need to look at the denominator. And the denominator is a little bit more difficult to solve because in the denominator, P tile is unknown. Remember that P tile is nothing else than P divided by B plus. And Q is not known, okay? Also A0 should be defined, but here's unknown there are P tiled and Q. And we will see that we can rewrite this green equation as in a matrix form. And this is the, the trick to solve a model following uh, or to design a model following controller is to, these are polynomial equations. Uh, an equation of two polynomials with unknowns, it's, I don't know how to solve it. When I've got a system like this, this one, if I write it in a matrix form, so M times some unknowns, P times Q equals V. If V is known, if M is invertible, so that M minus one, so I can write there exists M minus one, that is finite, so it's just R, R I don't know the, the, uh, the, the dimension right now, but let's say it's invertible. I can quickly find that my unknown, so P times Q, is just equal to m minus one v, and you all know this. And so the, the idea here is to rewrite a polynomial equation. This is a polynomial equation where the polyn where the coefficient of p tile and q are unknown, and to write it into a matrix form where m is invertible. This is the only kind of trick that is used to solve the model or to design the model following control. Now the question is, what is happening here? We got some a hats. We got some here another matrix, we have another line here, what is this term? And so we will look at this uh, into details, but what you should really remember is that here the idea is polynomial expression with unknown polynomial coefficient. I write it into a matrix form and then I can solve. This is the only idea that is important to remember here. So now let's look at this matrix, uh, how to transform this equation into a matrix. So to do that, first remember on the left here, we have A of this, this is from the plant. Okay, so A, B minus, this is from the plants. So it's not from the, it's known from the plants. A omega is the expected uh, poles. So it's also known. And A zero is an observer polynomial. So the observer polynomial, the idea is we need an observer polynomial of a given order. 
So we will define that the order of a0, I will write it na0 or in subscript maybe, so just like nao observer. This, uh, we will define it so that n is invertible. So remember the matrix m is invertible. That means that na0 should be equal to something. And then uh, na0 can be chosen as whatever we want. So as soon as we know the order of a0, we can place the poles of a0. It's called an observer polynomial. So that means that if the observer polynomial roots are faster than the system roots, then the, the observer is not changing my closed loop behavior because it's so fast that it's not changing anything. So this is also considered as known. And then we want to find p tide and q with the idea that p tide is uh, p divided by b plus. Last but not least, this is monic, monic and monic. Okay, so this a, a, w, and a zero always are monic polynomial. We're going to see that it's important. And p tile also is monic. Okay. Now we have our equation. This is the equation that we want to write in a matrix form. And so to write it in a matrix form, first we'll define that p times time a, which is the product of two polynomials. So it's a product of p times this one by a. So if I, I, I compute p time by a, I mean, I will do it. It's done in the PowerPoint, never mind. If I compute this, this is just a polynomial and we wish to write it into a matrix form. So a is a matrix and p tide is a vector, okay? So a, a matrix time a vector is equal to p tide a. So I should have written here, um, not equal, but equivalent to in the sense that p times a is a polynomial polynomial form and a times p tide is just a vector, okay? And so the relation in between is that if I've got here a polynomial, for example, uh, let's call it um, beta zero plus beta one z, for example, then it will be equivalent to a vector beta zero, beta one. So we will collect the coefficient of the polynomials into a vector form. So if we try to do this, so first we concentrate only on the first one, so on this one, we know and we can write that p tide a is equal to a p tide. First of all, two polynomials, you can just, uh, it's, yeah, it's commutative, so you can just multiply one polynomial by the other, or the first one by the second one, doesn't change anything. And we can compute it. And so if we compute it, p tide and a are monic, so the first term is always one. And then it's just a one times one plus one times p tide one, and so on. So we have all the coefficients. We can find a um, uh, kind of summation here, it's written when you can use it if you want. But the most important is that you can write it into a matrix form. So if we look into this matrix here, z to the power zero is the first line, sorry. So z to the power zero is this line and it should be equal to one. If we check this, we have one times one and then everything is zero, so that works. Then we have a1 times 1 plus p1, p tied 1 times 1. And also we have a1 times 1 plus p tied 1 times 1, and so on. So here you can just look at it at home. Uh, this, you can find it on your own. I mean, it's quite easy. It's just multiplying two polynomials. And if you want to write this into a matrix form, you will end up with this uh, representation here on top. Is this clear? This is really important because this is usually where students get lost. Here, there's nothing difficult. The only thing is we're multiplying two polynomials and we wish to find it as, uh, or to express it, express it as a matrix times a vector. And this will be collection, the vector that will result out of it is a collection of the coefficient of the polynomial of the product of the polynomials. So here we have this. There is something here that is not really nice that all the coefficients here are unknown, but here it's known. So usually when you write a system of equation, you have some, uh, for example, x, a, oh, sorry, x, uh, a, x equal b, for example, then all the coefficient x are unknown. Here it's not the case. So the last trick here we're using is we're splitting this matrix into uh, a part that we know and a part that we don't know. So here we can write this as, I can write in the right color. So first uh, a of z. So a of z is just one multiplying the first column. 
And the first column, as you can see, is just one time A of Z. So A of Z as a polynomial A of Z that is here, okay? And so it's A of Z, and then I can add plus the red matrix that I call A hat times the green matrix that I call P tied something, P tied hat, yeah. And so this is where it comes from, okay? Here, what is saying is that this matrix here, I don't want to have one into my unknown vector. So I just said that it's one times the first column that I can compute it, it's A of Z. And the second part is just the unknown vectors that I collect into P tied hat. This is the unknowns, these are the unknowns. And A hat is just this reduced matrix, okay? Also, we do not have to add this first, um, uh, first line multiplied by the green. So this multiplying this is obviously zero. So we can skip it. Is this understood by everyone? Uh, this is the, the last tricky thing to, to, to understand that uh, when you look at the equation, but first we have product of polynomial, write it into a matrix form. And then we say, okay, there's one of the coefficient that we know. So we remove it from the uh, unknown vector and we want to have only an expression with an unknown vector. And so here in the end, the important part is that this is our unknown vector or P tied at is unknown vector. So this is what we want to find. And A of Z is known and A hat also is known because A hat is just the coefficient of A1, A2 and so on, which are the coefficient from the plant denominator. Now, if this is clear, we can do exactly the same for the second equation or second term in our equation, which is Q times B minus. And here it will be even easier because Q zero is not one. So Q zero is already uh, an unknown. So we can do exactly the same, um, the same method. We can write it into a matrix form and this time we directly collect all our unknowns. So there is no more modification we need to make, okay? Now, if this is clear, then we know how to compute this term. We know how to compute this term, so Q B, min B minus, okay? There's two things left, this one, but this one is quite easy to compute because it's just two polynomials that we know. Remember that A0, we assume that the coefficients here are known, so we can just compute it, there's no problem. And we need to add Z minus one and Z minus D. So to add Z minus one, and z minus d here, this can be written as z minus d minus one, okay? And so it's equivalent to taking the, the matrix representation we have here and say that it's not z zero, but it's z minus d minus one. It's not z minus one, it's z minus d minus two, and so on up to here. It's z minus nb minus nq minus d minus one, okay? So we can just, keep exactly the same product and this say that the first line have a different, has a different meaning now. First line is not the coefficient of Z zero, but Z minus D minus one, okay? In our case, D is equal to zero, so it will be Z minus one. So now if you've understood everything I've been talking to right now, then everything is easy. We know this term, we know this term, we know this term. Idea is we need to write, as I've shown before, M, M times P tied at Q. So these are our unknown is equal to some V vector. So we just need to rearrange all the terms. And rearranging all the terms, this is what you end up with. Sorry, it was a little bit fast. So on the left-hand side here, we got our P times A. Here we got Q B minus. And here you can see if we add Z minus one and Z minus D, we will have a problem because or let's just play it. We could have a problem because when we put this matrix here and we want to put the B minus matrix or QB minus matrix. So this matrix is this one, okay? We need to make sure that the lines are in front of the correct lines. So for example, here, the first line of this matrix A hat is always Z minus one. The first line here on this, let's call it this green matrix here, it's, remember, I have to include all of this here. So it's always Z minus one, Z minus D. 
So that's why we need this orange matrix here. This orange matrix here is nothing else than shifting the lines. So adding lines here to this green matrix so that the first line has the same meaning as Z minus one. So if we got uh, D equals zero, then this matrix, orange matrix would be zero. It doesn't exist, it's just zero line. If D is 10, then the orange matrix will be 10 lines of zeros that the first line of QB minus this one will match Z minus one. Okay. Second thing, second thing to understand is here we write A hat that we plug in here times P tide. Okay. Then we are skipping one term. So the term in front of Z zero is we need to, to include it into the equation. So what we did is what we do is that we put it on the other side. And if we put it on the other side, we end up here with this uh, coefficient. So the first coefficient doesn't exist because remember the first line is Z minus one now. So if the first line is Z minus one, the first coefficient one, anyway, it's always one because it's one times one, it will always be one. So we remove it completely from the equation and we only take A one, which should be, which should match Z minus one. And so if we had minus A1 here, change color. So we have A1 minus A1 here. It's on the first line, okay? And it's perfectly matching Z minus one, okay? So here, the, the first thing is we take this matrix one times AZ, so this matrix here, and we put it into the right-hand side. So we put a minus sign in front of it. And we collect all the coefficient into a matrix form or a vector form in this case. And it's perfectly matching the right, you can check, it's perfectly matching the right um, uh, power of Z. And then we add a couple of zeros because here you can see there are some zeros, so we will get the same zeros here. Okay, uh, second thing, second thing we need to define AWA zero. So I already said it, you just take these two polynomials, you multiply one polynomial by the other, and then you collect the coefficient. Problem is you collect the coefficient in Z minus one up to whatever you want, so that, that's fine. The problem is there is no Z minus zero. AW is written here and A zero is written here. And if you remember, I said that both should be monic. And if both are monic, this is really important. If both are monic, that means that AW times A0 will be equal to one plus something Z minus one and so on, okay? Here is something, I don't care. So it will always be equal to one plus something else. And you remember that here, we have a one here because this one times one, so from P, side A is one plus something. And remember that the Z power zero here is not part of the equation, but still we should make sure that this is perfectly fulfilled. And so the one that we skipped from P tide A is always the one that we are skipping here on uh, this matrix here, we're skipping one plus something, okay? And so one on the right-hand side, one on the left-hand side, they're perfectly uh, matching each other. So here, really important thing to remember, this one times one for a Z zero, that's included in here, okay? So it's like making minus one. Here, I've got A, W, A zero. I defined it as A, W, A zero plus one, okay? And I know that this is always one plus something else. So it's one plus A, W, A zero hat. And this one is also not part of the equation here because I already have a minus one. So I just remove one on the left, remove one on the right. So it's perfectly matching, okay? So this is a tricky part. You can review this at home. Also send me a mail if it's not clear, but it's just a trick that the equation, all the coefficients of the equations are written in matrix form, but still we're only collecting here unknowns. We don't have one because if one, one we cannot solve it. Then we have these samples of the data. I already talked about it. So we're just shifting this QB matrix down, basically. And the last one, we want integral control. So remember, integral control is we want to add a pole at Z equals one, so Z minus one. So if you want to pull at Z equals one, that means that 
uh, if I take, um, uh, I mean, it's written in the, in the equation here, P at C equals one should be equal to zero, okay? And so if P at Z equals one should be equal to zero, that means that P at Z equals one is just the sum of all the coefficients. So the sum of all the coefficients is one, 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 one. This is just one, 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 just an array of one times this part. And so if I'm summing all these coefficients, I should be equal to zero. Remember that P zero tile is equal to one. It's also written here. So instead of being equal to zero, it should be equal to minus one. Okay, so this P zero tile is just shifted here. The, this last line, pink line, is just uh, adding the integral control. So it's just making sure that one of the closed loop of the system will be at one, okay? So now that we have this system, uh, we can just uh, check all the um, uh, dimensions of the matrices and the vectors so that everything is perfectly matching. This is also really important. So we define M is equal to some unknown vector P tile hat Q is equal to V. Uh, the dimension of M is perfectly known. Okay, it's dimension of N P tile N plus one, N P tile N Q plus one, whatever. Uh, dimension of P tile hat and Q is also known and dimension of these known. So when I mean it's known, it's expressed, for example, here as N P tile. And the question is what is N P tile, of course. And so we will just look at how we can match all these dimensions together. So the first thing is M must be square. If M is a square matrix, we can invert it and we can solve P tile hat and Q. So if M is a squared matrix, that means that this term here should be equal to this term here. Makes sense. Uh, NQ is equal by N because I can remove NP tile on both sides. I can remove one. And so N should be equals to NQ. N is the system order. So by definition is the order of N of A. A is the denominator of the uh, transfer function of the system transfer function. So this is the first condition, NQ should be equal to NA, it's equal to three. So that means that our polynomial Q is order three, nothing else than this. Then we look at the zero matrix. So this zero matrix here, uh, we, we want to find what the dimension of this matrix. So it has to be NQ plus one because there is NQ plus one elements here, so this is defined. And N zero should be equal such that there's the same number of rows here and there. So the number of rows there is NP tile. Uh, sorry, number of rows is NP tile plus N and N is NQ. So NP tile is NP tile, sorry, plus NQ. And on the right hand side matrix, so on this matrix here, if we count the number of lines of rows, we got D plus NB minus plus NQ plus one plus N zero. Okay, which is expressed here, plus n zero. And so out of this, uh, we can rearrange everything and we find n zero is equal to this, okay? So here to rearrange, if we rearrange, we collect everything and we put just n p tied on the left. So we're just removing n q first, then we can end up with this and then we put n zero on the left, everything else on the right, and we end up with this. Okay. Uh, what's important here to consider is that n zero is always bigger or equal than zero. N zero cannot be negative because n zero corresponds to the number of lines of this matrix, and a matrix can have zero line or a positive number of line, cannot be a negative number of line. And if we do the computation, n zero should be equal to zero, so it's perfectly fine. It means that this zero matrix in red doesn't exist but it's perfectly fine. Also, if you look in the lecture note, in the lecture note, you don't have this equation here, but you have uh, this equation where it is. Where it is in P plus, yes, you have this equation here, okay? So I've just added this um, uh, comment here so you can go through it. Uh, it's just to show that these are exactly the same. Okay, so you can just look at it at home. It's no, not really important, but this expression I'm using here in the exercise is rigorously equal to the one from the lecture note. Also in the lecture note, N0 is not defined. It's directly written. This is directly written here. 
Okay, so don't look for N0. It's just this expression is directly written into the matrix, um, uh, the matrix picture or the, the, I can show you so that there's no ambiguity because if you start looking for N0, you can look for hours because it doesn't exist in the lecture notes. Uh, model for in controller, where is it? It should be here. Uh -huh. Ah, here it is 67. So if you go in the model following controller equations here, you have this N0 here. So this is what I'm talking about. If you're interested to go a little bit further, so this NB time minus NQ plus NB plus minus D was defined exactly the way I defined it in the exercise, but it can also be written differently as I've just shown. So mainly it can also be written as, if I go back on the PowerPoint, uh, here it is. Uh, okay, so I will reopen the PowerPoint, don't worry. So while I'm reopening the PowerPoint, do you have any question now about what we've been doing? Or is everything perfectly clear? At least understandable. Don't worry, it's almost the end, you see here. Okay, so now you can see the PowerPoint again, right? So I was just explaining where the, uh, why this is, uh, this N0 here is a little bit different in the lecture notes, but it's exactly the same. Now we need to define the, the other polynomial. Uh, so we also look now at a compatibility of observer size. So need the same number of rows on both sides. So here you see that we have zeros here. And the idea is that in this matrix here, we do, we do not have zeros here because if we have zeros here, that means that some equation is equal to zero. So we have multiple solution, we don't want that. So what we want to make sure is that AWA0 as this AO, sorry, as the same number of lines, so the number of lines here is the same as the number of lines here. This is just the idea. So the number of lines in AWA0 is equal to NAWA0 uh, plus one, sorry. And it should be equal to NP type plus N plus one. So this just gonna be a little bit more specific here. If you multiply, um, so AW is one plus something A to Z, uh, NAW in this case, AZ, AO is one plus something Z to the power AO or minus AO doesn't, doesn't change anything. Then if I multiply those two terms, I will have NAW plus NAO plus one term, okay? But remember that one term is outside of, it's not in the system because it's multiplying that zero and we removed it. So here I will have NA omega plus NA zero term and one last line. Here I've got NP type plus N term and lines plus one line. And so this is what's written here basically. We can remove the one and then we define NA zero as NP type plus N minus NAW and we find three. So that means that our observer polynomial should have zero uh, poles that are faster than the plants, so that it's not doing anything basically, but it should be order three so that our system is invertible. So there is a unique solution. It's not about invertibility, it's really about having unique solution. Otherwise, if here we have, for example, two zeros at the end, our system has no one unique solution because here we have at least two equation with something. So m times our unknown p type at q is equal to zero, zero. So there's two equation out of all the equation here that are equal to zero and that leads to some numerical problem. So our observed polynomial should be order three. Now let's just design this um, observed polynomial. So it should also once again be greater than zero. We, can have, we cannot have um, a polynomial order negative doesn't exist. There's no problem. And we can design this uh, observable polynomial. So as I just said, third order. Then we choose some poles. So here just to choose something that's really fast, minus 92, minus 78, minus 70. There's a comma here missing. 
and I discretized it. Um, so this is in continuous time, in discrete time, which is 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03. Uh, I find the um, uh, polynomial, characteristic polynomial. And then I compute AW times A0. So AW times A0, it's just this computation. You can whether do it by hand like this. So here it's quite okay because it's only uh, seven terms. Sometimes it can be much longer. So in the MATLAB, I just use this formula here. This is more general. Uh, so just computing all the coefficient and then putting all the coefficient. Uh, so D0, D minus one, Z minus two. And remember that we're only interested in the negative part um, or the Z minus one up to Z minus something. So the first element here is removed to define this AW A0 hat. So here, if I've got all my coefficients, AW A0 hat is only the last part of the coefficient. So I remove the first one. And now that we did that, we have everything in hand. So now uh, we have our matrix, we know everything. We just plug all the numbers in MATLAB. And once we've plugged all the numbers in MATLAB, we can just solve it. So here, remember, this is written zero, but it's non-zero because a zero or the, the order of n zero is three, okay? So it's not zero, very important. And we find our p tied and q. So if we just have a quick look at what's happening in the MATLAB. Uh -huh. Or is it not working? Okay, so if we have a look at the MATLAB, uh, expected dominant uh, poles. So here we already did that. So we just compute the, the expected poles. Then we add one pole to it. Nothing interesting. Then this is for the, the computation of all the polynomial orders are given here. So it was just described in the, in the last slide. Then we define our uh, observe a polynomial with these poles here. And we define beta as just the coefficients, which is a, the formula is just shown you here. It's just an array function, whatever. You can do it by hand if you want. And we define this AWA0 hat. We only collect the last coefficient. So we remove the first coefficient. We remove the z to the power of zero. We should run this one. Then you can compute this, all these matrices. So this A hat, B, B minus, and whatever, you compute all the matrices. You can have a look at, at home. You can do it whether by hand. So just put the coefficient one by one or using some functions like here, but you can have a look at, at home. This is just, if you have question, you can, uh, you can send a mail afterwards. It's not a problem. This is just a programming basically. And then using here, I've used lin solve. You can also use if, uh, inv, so inverse of M times V, whatever. You find X and X are all the coefficient, remember, of P tide hat and Q. And so then you know that p tide add is the first n dot p tide, so the first coefficient that needed for p tide and q, the first coefficient for q. And you can then define that p tide hat and q as shown in the power point. So this is our p tide add polynomial, z to the power zero, z to the power minus one here, z to the power minus two, z to the power minus three. And for q, it's exactly the same, okay? So I'm going quite fast on MATLAB because you can have a look at home and it's not really important. Then if we go back to the PowerPoint, we can define P. Uh, so we know that P tiled times B plus is equal to P tiled and B plus this is just one. So P tiled is equal to P. So what we found before P tiled and Q, in this case is directly P and Q. And now, uh, the last part is to try to find F, okay? So to find F, if we try to find F so that the system is perfectly following the PT2, we end up with a problem. Uh, from a lot of slide before, you remember that we had two equations. We have one equation for the numerator and one for the denominator. And the one from the numerator was F should be equal to Z B tiled A0, okay? This was our um, equation. There was also, d minus d on the left and z minus d on the right, but we can remove this, okay? This is perfectly stable because we defined it, a0, a o, and it's perfectly known. b tiled is by definition bw divided by b minus. And this is a problem because if we design this here, so it's uh, given here uh, on the right, 
then first it's unstable because B minus is by definition the unstable zeros. And second of all, if I rewrite it a little bit differently, here I've got a uh, third order system because I've got Z minus three and here is Z zero and Z minus three, Z minus one, second order. So this is non-causal system, if you remember. It's non-causal because I've got third order divided by second order. Otherwise I've got zero plus something and zero here, I've got a non-zero value here. This was the other explanation. So if we do this, if we try to match the PT2 behavior at any time, then it's non-causal and it's unstable. So that's not possible. So the second option is to match the PT, it's to match only the unit gain, okay? We're uninterested in the unit gain. If you remember, it was already computed that the sum of AW, so our closed loop is PW divided by AW times A0, A0, Z minus D. And in um, steady state, so A0, we can uh, compensate each other. In steady state, Z is equal to one. If Z is equal to one, this is one. And so I end up with all the coefficient, the sum of all the coefficient of BW should be the sum of all the coefficient of AW, which should be this, okay? So this is our first uh, condition. This is what we want to enforce in the system. So now BW, we can rewrite it. Uh, this way, so f of z is, it's just taken from this expression here, okay? Or this one rather. So f of z so should be equal, only the steady state gain is um, taken. So I evaluate this at z, my, at z equals one times a zero. A zero, I, I keep it the full a zero because I know it's on the numerator and the denominator. So it will be compensated. And so if I do that, I've got this is unstable and non-causal but I'm only evaluating it at one. So it's just a constant, okay? This is just a scalar value. And this is the trick. So here we're saying it's A0 times a scalar, okay? Such that uh, in steady state, uh, omega equals one. This is the only thing we can do. And so when we're not in steady state, we should diverge a little bit from the PT2 behavior. And so we can compute this and we end up with, this is nothing else than A0, times a uh, constant, call it lambda, whatever. And so we have our three polynomial this way. So it was probably a little bit fast. You can look at it at home. It's really easy. If we always try to follow the PT2, it's not possible. It's non-causal, it's unstable. If we only match the, un the, steady, the steady state gain, then it's perfectly uh, possible because f of z becomes just a0, which is by definition stable, so a o, sorry that is by definition stable because we choose the poles times a scalar. And if you multiply polynomial by a scalar, the poles are exactly the same. And so now we can just uh, do a test in uh, MATLAB. So I will directly go into MATLAB. It's going to be easier to see what's happening. So pre-filter is not feasible. So here I just computed the thing that is not feasible. And then I compute uh, the one that is feasible. So only with the steady state gain. And finally, I do the simulink computation. If I quickly open the, the simulink file. So here is a simulink file. So what I've got is, I've got my input W here. So this is my input. I've got my output. So the output is a little bit of a mess, but it's here. And so the first loop, this loop, okay, is the PT2 loop. So this is uh, BW, AW star, uh, yeah. Then I've got the second loop. So this, this is just open loop because in PT2, we already have the closed loop poles. Then I've got the second loop here, which is my reference. The second loop here is BW, sorry, a w z minus d. Uh, is it also a w star? No, it's a w z minus d. And finally, I've got my, let's say the, the real system. So f of z, one over p, this is the plant with its uh, dead time z minus d. This is the q polynomial. Uh, this we don't care, it's disturbed for now on. And that's pretty much all. And everything here is just for uh, mapping the signal to, to MATLAB. So here, what I want to show is that this is my real system closed loop, okay, the real closed loop of Z. And so we're comparing three terms 
this is expected uh, PT2 behavior without the plan dead time, without the plan zeros, without the additional poles that we design. This is the expected behavior with the, um, all the poles that we design and the plan dead time, but still there's the zeros of the plant are not included. And this would be exactly the same as this one, but also we add the plant zeros to it, to the, um, to the simulation, okay? And now if we look at the results, remove this. If we look at the results, we can see that it's not working. Please move it from workspace. So let's just play everything again. Okay, so we have our uh, multiple elements. So in blue, you have the reference. So I want to do a step of one. In orange, you got the PT2. If I zoom in a little bit, in orange, you got the PT2. So the PT2 does not include the plant uh, dead time, for example. Then we got the reference, which includes the plant dead time and the additional poles, which obviously is like shifted in time. And finally, we got in uh, uh, purple, we got the real system output. And so we can see that with model following controller, the Y ref and the Y plants, so the yellow and purple line are pretty much the same. The only difference is that the purple one also includes unstable zeros from the plants. And once again, if you remember what I said at the beginning, if you look here, the yellow signal, if I have to draw it again, is continuously increasing at the beginning like this, whereas the real system, so our plant, still has some uh, so-called non-minimal phase behavior, I'm gonna do it in red. So it's increasing, decreasing, and then increasing again. And this is because of the unstable zero. And this is the, the really important part. With model following controller, you try to remove the zero dynamics, but you cannot remove the unstable zero dynamics. This is, if you understood that, you understood what model following controller is used for and what the limitation of model following controller. Okay, now there's another thing. So you will have all the MATLAB files at home. So you can also add some disturbance. So here I just add some disturbance on the uh, feedback loop. Uh, so on the output directly, so it's just some white noise. So you can see that it's still perfectly doing what we expect, but there is some noise on the, on the output signal and you can just have a look at one. This is not really important, it's just to show that our system is perfectly stable. And even if we had some disturbance, it's still stable because we defined it with some poles that are stable basically. Okay, so I know that the end was a little bit um, fast, but you have all the, examples at home, you have all the MATLAB code at home. So I prefer just that you look at it at home and then you ask question if, if you have some. And now let's move to the first and the only question for today. So this will be a really easy question, but it's just to check rapidly that you understand the main point of or one of the main point of model following controller. So what condition is mandatory? There's only one statement that would be a mandatory condition to design a following controller, a model following controller. The first condition is that the plan zeros always need to be stable, otherwise you cannot design a model following controller. The second is that the system dead time cannot be greater than the closed loop denominator order. So the expected closed loop, remember it's JWC is P W of C divided by A W of C times Z minus D. You can also include A zero over A zero, but it's just canceling out. So this is saying that this D here has to be smaller than the order of this polynomial. The third statement is that the plant needs to be strictly causal. So you cannot have a plant with direct fit through, or if you have, you cannot use model following controller. And the last statement is that the plant pose need to be stable. If the poles of the plant are not stable, you cannot use model following control. So let me just quickly open the poll. And please take, yeah, I mean, there's no equation or whatever. It's just, if you understood what we've been talking about, you should be able to guess what the correct answer. Everyone almost answered now. Also, we kind of already, a little bit short of time, so I'm going to stop it anyway. 
most of you answered it uh, correctly. So just to read you a little bit, uh, the plant zeros needs to be stable. That's not true. If, if some plant uh, zeros are not stable, you cannot compensate it, but you can still apply model following controller. Uh, the system dead time, blah, 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 this is completely wrong because, because it's just, you can have any dead time you want, doesn't change anything. You cannot compensate the dead time, but it's not a problem to design a model following controller. The plan needs to be strictly causal. This is really important because you need, remember, that A of Z should be written as one plus something and B of Z should be written as zero plus something. So you need to be strictly causal. And the plant poles need to be stable. In our case, it, they were stable, but if they're unstable, you don't care because you will design anyway a, a feedback loop in a sense. So you will choose what are the closed loops here. So really good on this question. And now before uh, answering any of your question, I just want to make a quick uh, conclusion. First, remove the annotation, okay. And so add the really fast conclusion. So correct answer with this, the C, as I said. So just as a conclusion, this model following control method is used first to enforce some PT2 behavior of the closed loop. The goal is to place all the remaining poles, uh, poles that you need so that the system is causal in the end, um, far away from the PT2 poles, let's say. So add some poles that are really fast, but it's exactly the same as for a pole placement method up to here. You can compensate the plant stable zeros, but not the unstable zeros of the plants. This is really important. Uh, unstable, of the, unstable zeros cannot be removed from the closed loop. So you will have deviation from PT2 as we've just seen. You have this non-minimal phase behavior at the beginning. Instead of having increasing signal, you have something a little bit like that at the beginning. Uh, you add integration of the control error. You can see this with the disturbance. I haven't talked that much, but if you add the disturbance to the output, it's, there is still no steady state error. It's compensated very quickly because of the integration that we've added. And finally, we can add uh, observer polynomial, or we need to add an observer polynomial so that we have only one unique solution. And so we have the invertibility of the linear system. Finally, pre-filter simplification. Most of the time you cannot compute a pre-filter so that the output, expected output is exactly following the PT2, but you always, or most of the time you only enforce the unit steady state gain. So this was it for today. Now, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. I can answer any question regarding this session. Uh, probably I was a little bit fast on some points, but I wanted to do it in one and a half hour. It was quite challenging. Uh, still, if you have some question, I'm open. Also, if you have question on previous sessions or in the lectures or whatever. Otherwise, thank you for joining today and I will see you this afternoon for the lecture.